all so much for being here tonight. It's nice to see so many of you here. Uh, my name is Rachel Hansen and I teach in the English department and oversee our creative writing program where we are very fortunate to have many smart and talented undergraduate writers and scholars taught by um, very dedicated faculty. We are also fortunate to have a vibrant visiting writer series and we feel quite lucky to have John Jeremiah Sullivan here with us tonight who Wiley Cash will introduce, introduce right after I share a few housekeeping notes. Um, so this is our last event of the semester, um, but next semester we are hosting the U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Lamon on Monday, March 20th here in the Blue Ridge Room. And the fiction writer and Rose, uh, Rome Prize recipient Stegner Fellow, Jamel Brinkley, um, he will be here with us on Thursday, April 6th, also here 7 p.m. in the Blue Ridge Room. Uh, Dr. Abrams, uh, Erica Abrams Locklear, the Thomas Howerton Distinguished Professor of Humanities, will be hosting the historian Adrian Miller, who will give a talk on Southern Black Chefs in the White House. Um, and that will be the first event next semester, Wednesday, February 22nd. And that one's going to be at 6, so I look forward to seeing you all back here, but an hour earlier. Months away. All right. Don't worry. We'll send out reminders. So I know uh, we have a lot of students in the audience tonight, and I'm sure you um, will have many questions um, for our author this evening. And luckily, he's agreed, uh, agreed to leave just a little bit of time for a few questions at the end of uh, his reading. As you will notice, there is a microphone right there. Um, just line up. Don't be shy. Come ask your questions. And um, finally, uh, there are books for sale in the back of the room, which you can purchase and have signed this evening, so also do that. All right, so without further ado, um, I'm gonna turn things over to uh, the one and only Wiley Cash. Uh, please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you, Rachel, and thank, uh, thank you for all your work setting this series up and um, getting, getting a, a nice crowd uh, out here tonight. And I hope that you all do have uh, questions for John at the end, you know, uh, as writers, our, our work doesn't change, but the questions change. Uh, and the questions that, that you get asked at an event makes it feel new and vibrant. And sometimes you see it in a way you've never seen it before. So no pressure to be brilliant, right? If you just want to ask like, hey, manual typewriter or pencil, you can ask that. Um, and if you don't want to ask at the mic and you just want to shout it out, I'm sure John can repeat the question for everybody, everybody to hear. Um, but it's really great. Y'all could have been anywhere tonight. You chose to be here. So thank you so much for, for making that decision and supporting the literary arts here at UNC Asheville. John Jeremiah Sullivan is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine and the Southern editor of the Paris Review. He's written for GQ, Harper's Magazine, and The Oxford American, and he's the author of the books Blood Horses and Pulphead. The seemingly divergent essays in Pulphead ricochet between a hilarious yet stirring portrait of the Tea Party movement circa 2009, a deep dive into the origin myths surrounding Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose, and meditations on loneliness, identity, and what is perhaps the most American trait of all, our protean ability to recast ourselves in different renditions throughout our lifetimes. Over the past decade or so, critics have wondered aloud and on the page if John Jeremiah Sullivan is the best essayist in the world. No pressure, John. I struggled with whether I would say that. Um, but what does that even mean? That he writes catchy intros? that he can structure a narrative, that he can trace thematic elements to their stirring, shocking, or uplifting conclusions? Maybe. You know, of course he does all of those things. But what he does best, and I would argue as well, if not better than anyone, he does it before he even sits down to write. 
he sees. He sees the jewel in the dirt and plucks it from the ground, whether it's the real world road rules challenge or a Christian rock festival. And he tells us why it matters. He is not only able to do this with our contemporary moment, he is able to do it with our past. As the co-founder of the nonprofit Third Person Project down in Wilmington, North Carolina, John and others are working to uncover the many moments of the past to reveal the South's buried history. There are jewels, and many of them have been buried on purpose. And we should all be glad that John Jeremiah Sullivan is there to do the digging. And I'm so glad that he's here with us tonight. I welcome John Jeremiah Sullivan. Great to see all of you. Thank you for having me, and thank you, Wiley, for that introduction. Thanks, Rachel, and, and to the English department here at um, UNC Asheville. Um, I also, I, uh, there's a special person in the audience tonight. The father of my brother-in-law is here. So, Roger, thank you for being here. He lives here in Asheville, and I, I, um, I, I, I don't get to see him all that often, so this is a treat. Um, while we were uh, um, on our way here from Wilmington, Wiley um, drove me over, and we stopped at we stopped at a restaurant in his hometown of Gastonia, um, where we ordered these um, hamburgers that had chili on them and a sweet tea slushy, which was a thing I had never seen before, and. Um, and I got back to the hotel room and, and realized that he had been trying to sabotage me. And, and <laughs> if you hear any strange sounds from my body while I'm reading, you'll know that it's the, you'll know what's going on. Um, I, I, I've been writing mostly, um, or, or I should say I've been publishing mostly fiction and poetry the last couple years partly because I'm supposed to be writing and publishing nonfiction projects, and, and it's a way of hiding from the deadlines, but also my, my, my imagination is just going that, going that direction for some reason. So if it's okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna read um, um, a couple of poems and a couple of short fiction pieces. Although I realized, just as I'm saying that, that they have a lot in common, and the poems are a lot like short nonfiction pieces, and the short fiction pieces are a lot like poems. And I guess that's, I guess that's kind of what I've been up to is just working in some sort of in-between genre. Um, but I, 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 I like to read new stuff because you, you, it's you're, you're reading what's hot in your brain and, and what and what is really coming out of you as a writer at that moment. And when I read older um, material, it, it sometimes feels kind of vaudeville or something, you know, like you're impersonating yourself. Um, so the first piece I'm going to read, this is a, a poem that's going to be in the Yale Review at the end of this year. Um, it's kind of, you can see it has these long lines um, and they're, they're, they're actually running it um, like vertically, you know, so you'll have to turn the journal to, to read it, which I think they weren't real excited about. But I, but I wanted to, um, I, I, I liked this line structure that, that just kind of evolved in the writing of the poem. It's, um, it allowed me to fall into a kind of formal, cadence with the poem without feeling super self-conscious that I was writing in a in a some you know in a verse form that felt sort of antiquated or I, I don't know it just felt right so um, my my daughter the poem's dedicated to my daughter Maria who's 17 now and um, she went last summer to up to New York for a like a journalism camp thing like a two-week journalism camp and she was really excited about it. It was the first time she'd ever been in the city by herself, or any city by herself, um, which is good because she was 16. And it would be, you know, social services would be after me if she spent a lot of time in cities by herself. But she got a, a positive COVID test when she'd been up there just about 
72 hours. So here, here she is, this kid, you know, suddenly she's totally isolated in a dorm room at like Fordham and uh, in the middle of the city and all of her new friends are having fun and she was really bummed out. So I was doing everything I could to entertain her on text and whatnot. And um, she has always thought she likes my high school stories and I told her a story about this band called The Toll that came out of the high school I went to and, and oh, I, I lived in high, Ohio for four years when I was high school age. Um, I had played her their videos and whatnot. And she thought they were really bad and funny. So I wrote her this poem called The Toll for Maria. My one claim to fame is I went to the same Ohio high school as the guys in the band The Toll. The Toll was, were, are, considered the biggest thing ever to have come out of that school. I went there 10 years after they did, which meant I was going there right when they blew up. Or rather, when the series of events that was meant to have been there blowing up took place. We're talking about the period from 1988 to 92, years of the Gulf War and birth of the web. During those years, the band lived in a warehouse right down the street from our high school. But of course, they were touring a lot and treated the warehouse as their headquarters mainly. A guy I was friends with knew them. He took me there once. The band was somewhere else. There was so much gear every piece stenciled in white with the name of the band, The Toll. A reporter in Pittsburgh asked the lead singer, Brad Sircone, why they had chosen that name. We want to pay the toll for what society has forgotten to do, humanize one another, he said. Another reporter asked Sircone about his lyrics writing process, and Sircone replied this way, one night after fasting for a couple of days and reading as much literature as I could absorb, I began narrating. The toll manifested a quality best described as ecstatic pretentiousness. They are remembered today, if at all, for having made one of the longest videos ever on MTV. The video is for Jonathan Toledo, a song about the mistreatment of Native American tribes. The opening lyrics of the song are delivered in spoken word style by Sir Cone, who mumbles, slavery under the government in America. This he leaves hanging there as a named thing. All funds for this proceed will go nowhere, he says, and then maybe into your consciousness. Jonathan Toledo is a real person. He ran a plumbing company in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sir Cohn dated Toledo's daughter, so the song is named for the lead singer's girlfriend's dad. The Toledo family, family belonged to the Jemez Indian tribe. That's all anybody knows about them. The chorus of the song is triumphant, anthemic, glorious, catchy, rousing, all of those words. Nobody has ever had the vaguest idea what the words mean, not even the hardest core fans. Jonathan Toledo made his home in New Mexico, it begins, straightforwardly and obscurely. That repeats once. After it, there's another line. 19th Sunday, this is the rose, let it go. The Albuquerque Journal predicted the song should hit a nerve with many New Mexicans. I remember the way we used to chant those lines at toll concerts at the Newport Music Hall which were the first real rock shows that I ever attended. We would pump our fists in the air. 19th Sunday, this is the rose, let it go. 19th Sunday, this is the rose, let it go. The way we chanted along, it was as if we were ready to go to war for whatever that meant. Sir Cohn often grew intense on stage. The label signed them on the strength of their live shows. He had been a wrestler in high school and even played some college football, very physical. His moves as a performer were often compared to those of Jim Morrison, a thing he resented. The Toll could be one of the great American bands, said the A&R man, Michael Rosenblatt. I don't know if Rosenblatt was heavy into cocaine, but it would help to account for his words. 
A critic for the Philadelphia Inquirer described the first record as so unremittingly annoying, so ostentatiously pretentious, so utterly lacking in anything approaching a sense of humor that this album exerts a certain fascination and implored his readers, don't pay this toll. <laughs> In mid-October of 1988, an unfortunate accident happened at a Pittsburgh club called Graffiti. Sir Cohn climbed onto a balcony and fell and broke his foot. The fall tour had to be postponed. The delay lasted months, too many for marketing's sake. The album sank and didn't resurface. When we graduated high school, we were still waiting for them to become the next something. Here's a bit of told trivia. Richard Butler of the Psychedelic Furs produced the band's demo. If I were a journalist, I might find a way to get in touch with him and ask how that happened. As it is, I only scratched around online a little, out of idle, where are they now, curiosity. Sir Cohn appears to be still living in Ohio. He has rebranded himself as a brand consultant. He was always good at branding, it turned out. Consider how he built the toll into a brand. They had the one song, he and his cousin, the guitarist, with words no one really understands. Because of the boldness and distinctiveness of the manner in which the song was delivered, how many thousands of people remember them, both words and band? Several thousands. A thousand people lined up outside in the winter wind of central Ohio in the earliest 90s singing about this Jemez man named Jonathan Toledo, who made his home in New Mexico. 19th Sunday, this is the rose, let it go. 19th Sunday, this is the rose, let it go. 19th Sunday, this is the rose, let it go. 19th Sunday, this is the rose, let it go. <clears throat> um, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, read some pieces that were in the Paris Review a couple years ago that are about sleep. Uh, I, I, I am a very bad sleeper, and I come from a family that where uh, we all have sleep problems. My mother always jokes that any member of our family can call the others at three in the morning and sort of count on them to be awake. And uh, I was going through a period when I had an, un an unusually bad um, insomnia and I was trying different medications for it and not having a whole lot of luck. And um, those of you who deal with clinical insomnia, and you get into kind of a fugue state after a while where you're just sort of moving through the world that way. and, and um, uh, and, and I started writing these short pieces about sleep as a way of just, it wasn't even therapeutic really, it didn't help me at all, but, but, it, um, but it just felt natural. Um, it's so weird how writers are always trying to explain why they did, why they wrote certain things, and nobody has any freaking idea. It's all compulsion, you know. So I should just leave it at that, I wrote these. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the title of the overall thing, the overall project is Utkeara, which is a beautiful old, old English slash Middle English word that means dawn sorrow. It referred to the sadness if you've been up all night and you see that the sun is coming up and you're still not asleep and they had this beautiful word for that, for that state, Utkeara. Uh, the first piece is called Chair. When I was small, my parents would host a lot of parties. I don't know if they had more friends then or were just, as people say, at a more social place in their lives. But at least once a month, there would be a bunch of adults in our apartment drinking crappy wine and trying to play our untunable piano. There is something powerful for a child about your parents having people over. It's not anything that happens at the parties, but the evidence they give you that people feel safe where you live. That must go back to the savannah. Sometimes things happened at the parties that I was probably too young to see, but nothing scarring, just grown-up scenes. 
The air was bluish with different kinds of smoke. I have a memory of my father giving me a sip of wine on a sofa shortly after I turned four. Or one of the guests might say something inappropriate, for me cryptically so, and then at a look from my mother turn red and apologize. They had accidentally given me a glimpse of the darker and more serious world that otherwise lay unthinkable miles ahead. Guests would start to show up at around eight, meaning that I was allowed up for only the first hour or so. In reality, I would lie awake much longer than that listening to the chatter through the walls. My mother used to sit beside me for a few seconds. She was a high school chemistry teacher, always bone thin. She would pat my head and ask if I was okay, like that. You okay, kid? Her own carefully shaped and hairsprayed hair. I knew better than to try to make her read to me like on other nights. She'd say, you know I want to, honey, but I can't be rude to our guests. And then she would leave closing the door very softly, and I would lie there listening for hours, it seemed to me. But given how kids' brains are with time, it may have been minutes. Things went differently one night. I don't know why this happened. That is, I can't grope my way back into a conscious motive. But as nine approached with the first little woos of drowsiness, I got up and left the party without needing to be told. Instead of going to my bedroom, I walked to my father's office, which when parties started, everybody suddenly called the coat room. There was a chair in there where all of the guests threw their coats. It was a big round chair like a bowl or a bird's nest called a papasan chair. People used to have them. I don't really see them anymore. The room was dark. The only light came from an orange street lamp outside the window. I pulled the door behind me until it was almost shut, but not quite, and approached the chair. There weren't a ton of coats, maybe seven. It wasn't nine yet, and a lot of the guests tended to arrive later, ten-ish. The few that were visible, strange how well I remember, were a khaki overcoat, a fuzzy orange one with large buttons, and a fur which had an unfamiliar, cool, animal slickness to it. Without thinking, possibly worried that someone would walk in behind me, I dove into them, burrowing my way down to the bottom of the bowl. I curled into a ball and lay there on my side. At first, I had no breathing hole, and my breath was making the air warm. It smelled like my breath which didn't smell bad and was even enjoyable in the way of secret gross pleasures. But eventually I had to reach through and open a little airway. The cooler air from the room hit my face. The radiator in the corner made hammer sounds that were always mysteriously cavernous. The pipe did not seem large enough to have produced them. The only sounds I've heard since that reminded me of those were inside of an MRI machine. Under the coats, it grew warm and slightly moist. It had started raining. The most recently added coats were wet. I felt sleep coming, the first stage when your thoughts start to fray. I opened my eyes and mouth as wide as they would go and resisted. The door creaked and someone walked in, a man by the weight and hard flat sound of his steps on the wood. He threw a coat onto the pile. He may have thrown two. The added weight seemed too much for one. He left without saying anything. I don't know why I include that. Why would he have spoken? But he didn't mutter or anything. This kept happening. A person would walk in, or sometimes two or three, and another coat or more coats would be thrown on top of me. Then the person would leave the room, and a few seconds later the party would get a tick louder. That went on for a while. I did not sleep, but lay there in a purely physical state of anxiety. No dread, in other words, but alert to the danger of being discovered. Once a woman came in, I heard her humming to herself. At first I thought she was neatening the coats. They moved and kept moving. No, she was rummaging for her own, leaving early. 
I froze in expectation that she would feel the lump, but she didn't. Her coat must have been in the middle. She had not stayed long at all. I heard her walk out of the room and then the higher pitch of the goodbyes. I heard tentative music and something made of glass broke, followed by groaning and laughter. I never moved except to squirm my limbs every so often. I tried to move so gradually as to be imperceptible, like a tree sloth, in case someone walked in. And then two people did. I heard the door close all the way until it clicked, the first time it had done that. There were muffled sounds I didn't recognize. I heard mouth noises and a sort of panting. They were kissing. The woman's voice said, but if he already knows, the man sighed, please, one time can we not do this? Then more mouth noises and a rustling of fabrics. They said other things. I have been remembering what they said my whole life. After a minute, they left. I was at the bottom of the nest, breathing through my air hole with easily 20 coats on top of me. And finally, I drifted off. To this day, if someone brings up the subject of sleep, if a person is having trouble sleeping, for instance, and talks to me about it, my mind goes back to the chair. I can't say how long I spent there, three hours? At a certain point, my eyes snapped open in the dark. A deep laughing voice said, hey, there's a kid in here. Then a female voice whispering, what? Then the first voice, even more loudly this time, Ron, I think your kid's in here. My father from out in the hallway said, what? I clawed my way up out of the coats and chair as if from the grave and walked straight to my bedroom, not looking at any of them, and fell instantly back asleep. My parents never said anything about it, not the next morning or ever. They may not even have remembered that part of the night. Um, thank you. Uh, this next one is called Nature. Only in the 80s was it discovered that bees sleep. A scientist studied them with a thermographic camera and observed that the bees would sort of go down onto their faces and stop moving, and that while they slept, some of them held each other's legs. There are people, learned people, who argue that bullfrogs never sleep. Whether this means that they are always awake is a different matter. They are always perhaps in a state between sleep and waking, torpor. This is how they seem when you look at their eyes. Dolphins go to sleep on one side of their brains, but keep the other side awake so they can keep swimming and breathing. They often swim in circles when they sleep in this fashion. Bats sleep hanging upside down, as is widely known, and so do some species of whale. Both share an ancestor, a four-footed furry mammal that walked on the ground. One line of that creature's descendants took to the seas one to the sky. Now they both sleep upside down and would never dream of each other. The bat sleeps hanging that way because it cannot take off, only let go. Honduran white bats sleep bunched up in little green tents made of folded jungle leaves. They tumble out of them to fly. Whales dive far down to perform their sleep. Divers have come upon them, hanging there motionless, as if bewitched. The beautiful red-throated frigate bird sleeps while it flies. It can stay in the air for two months at a time. It flies hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles over the ocean, despite the fact that it cannot swim. Its mind sleeps for 10 seconds at a time, but over and over. <clears throat> The seconds add up. Sea otters sleep on their backs in the ocean and often sleep holding hands or forefeet to ensure they don't drift away from one another. They like to lie in beds of kelp and let their bodies get wrapped up in the fronds and float along with it. 
Tigers sleep for 20 hours a day. Their work is a ferocious blaze between long stretches of dream. Zebras lock their necks together and sleep on each other's sh shoulders. Many fish will simply let themselves settle to the bottom of a stream. I do not think that they close their eyes. Orangutans make themselves new beds almost every night, weaving together leaves and branches into a bowl-shaped nest. Scientists say that orangutan beds are harder at the edges for structure and softer in the middle for comfort. They like to make their beds high, sometimes as high as 120 feet above the ground. One theory about the hypnic jerk the shudder we sometimes feel just at the instant of succumbing to sleep is that our genes remember those days when there was constant danger of dozing off on a limb. The Greenland shark has a Latin name, Somnius microcephalus, that means sleepy small head, because they seem sluggish and do possess proportionately small heads. They can live for 500 years. Despite the name, scientists are unsure if the animal ever really sleeps. If not, it would mean that some Greenland sharks have been awake for half a millennium. Little raccoon-faced African meerkats sleep in huge groups down in their burrows. They cluster up into mobs, the scientific term, to keep warm and protect one another. Sometimes as many as 50 will sleep in one mob. They build rooms in their burrows for sleeping and do nothing else there. They get up every morning and go about their work. Not hibernators, in other words. Hibernation, from the Latin hiberna, winter quarters. We know about bears, but turtles and even some birds do it. One might assume that cicadas hibernate during their famous cycles of 17 years in the ground, but it turns out that they are awake the whole time, digging and eating and fleeing moles before they emerge screaming. A recent anthropological study suggests that our own ancestors, Homo heidelbergensis, went through a period when they hibernated to survive the most hideously cold millennia of the Ice Ages. Apparently, they were not very good at it and tended to sicken soon after. The greatest hibernator of all is the snail. When the weather gets cold or dry, snails first go in search of places where they feel safe among rocks or leaf litter. There they close themselves up. The snail moves in a shell that is its dwelling, and when it wants to hibernate, it makes a covering over the entrance. This is called an epiphram, Greek for lid, the snail concocts it of mucus and calcium. The lid seals in moisture and keeps the snail from drying out. Inside its damp chamber, the snail sleeps and waits for rain. Sometimes it sleeps for years. No one knows if snails dream. Someone may know. Evidence suggests that certain birds dream and that in their dreams, they are singing. <clears throat> this one's called Trench. It's a little, it's a little different. Um, found text, I guess, is the is the term. Um, I'm gonna have a, have a sip of coffee. Put that on top of the sweet tea slushy, <clears throat> which was really good, by the way, if you ever get a chance to get one. Um, <clears throat> trench, this is called. Please excuse this paper, as the trenches are very muddy, and my skin is parched with the fever that accompanies lack of sleep. Your boy has been tramping half over Europe, sleeping in trenches, doing without home comforts for months. He deserves, and you want to give him,
just a little more comfort. Here and there, as one moves, shadows loom out of the mist. The close standing sentries, singular figures, hidden in vapor to the waist, all wearing heavy cloaks of different types. You can see the men asleep on their horses, chins sunk on their chests. Sleep next to hunger and thirst is the greatest and most persistent appetite of the battlefield. There is a story about an infantryman who fell asleep over his bayonet, received the point in his neck, and died. Shells which fell into an Austrian camp killed sleepers. Some of the sleepers did not hear the shells. Others opened their eyes, stared, and went to sleep again. German troops in Flanders are so exhausted by British raids Many have fallen asleep at their posts, not caring if they are killed or captured. It is in a semi-unconscious state that most of the acts of heroism are performed. So men become heroes without their knowing. While making a tour of the line this morning, I came across complete sections fast asleep in spite of its being dawn. Three sections had removed their equipment a condition of affairs which up to this time would have been thought unbelievable in an army notorious for its discipline. One section had got in about a foot and then being so utterly fagged out for they'd had no sleep for nights, simply lay down. Many of them are young and their bronzed faces look quite boyish while they sleep. It is heartbreaking work to be obliged to go about kicking the poor fellows up Two of them, in order to be warmer, had cuddled up together. Men take corpses for pillows, and if permitted, doze through the day. You are walked on all the time, but you are much too tired to mind. Shooing off rats is one of the industries. If a fellow went to sleep in a trench with a piece of chocolate on his person, he would soon have a dozen rats fighting to get the sweet meat. Boys sleep with their cheeks to the stocks of their rifles. I slept wrapped in a Dutchman's blanket that smelled and was closely inhabited by the shirt squirrels that play all over you. I have slept with only an oil cape over me and I've been without a blanket entirely. On the firing line, the men sleep in dugouts hollowed out under the sides of the trenches, constructing cells according to their ingenuity. All outside is a waste of mud. As a surgeon in charge of a field hospital two miles behind the battlefront, I noticed about three months ago that the wounded in many cases suffered more from nightmares than from wounds. I learned from those who had patiently endured sickness, mutilation, privation, and endless strain that the worst terrors of the trenches were the visitations of sleep which dominate even the waking mind with a violence impossible to shake off. I watched one man, a nightmare victim, crouch beside his cot, trembling with eyes wild and staring. I am so tired, he said, but I will not sleep again. Such a dream. It is no uncommon sight to see sleeping men walking behind the lines with arms outstretched and terror depicted on their faces, seeking regiments that in their dreams they had lost. The following is a description by Private M, British. Once it came six nights in succession, sleep in the trenches claps itself on you like a shock. You were so worn out that the moment you sink into a sitting position, you are asleep, but there is no rest. You dream. You were lost in a tangled, doubling line of trenches. You were all alone, except that you walk among the bodies of the dead. The dream trenches, some hewn seemingly from solid rock, others dug out of the turf, are the exact duplicate of the trench in which you are sleeping, except for their winding course, and except for the fact that the men who lie in them, as close as they lie in the trenches of the living, do not answer when you speak to them. Abraham S. Sromwasser made a novel plea for exemption. 
piano teacher of Brooklyn, Russian, Jewish, 28. He claimed to be a somnambulist and expressed a dread of walking into a German trench in his pajamas one night. Here, not even the dead find rest. I realized with a shudder that the men are plagued by their own dead. Mine explosions unearth them at every moment. In April, I saw bodies of men who fell in October. Some of our men were so exhausted that they lay down and could go no further. They said, we must have sleep. And they lay down right there and slept with the Germans close to them. One of our younger officers, seeing this and knowing it could not be, remembered he'd seen in the village toy shop drums and penny whistles. He went into that shop and bought all those toys and came out and gave them to his sergeants. Play something, he said. The sergeants played that old tune, the British Grenadiers. When these tired men heard that music, they staggered up on their feet again and marched again, and they turned again, and they fought again. Loud applause. All sentences but the one you are reading are drawn more or less verbatim from articles that appeared in small town American newspapers between 1915 and 1918, at which time the subject of sleep became of great interest to scientists, owing in large part to the horrific experiences of a radical sleeplessness undergone by the soldiers who fought in the trenches. Meanwhile, as day wore on, panic grew. Sleeplessness began to tell Three men had gone mad entirely. Two had to be shot. Others began to dig deeper to escape the horror of it all. During the uproar of shells, I noticed a ground mole digging in as fast as his entrenching tools could work. As I watched him, it occurred to me that Mr. Mole was a very wise animal, and I wished I was a mole. When I got back to the base, I was so dead beat that I could not eat. I didn't care whether I lived or died. I had a bath without knowing what I was doing. Dead Letter, July 29, 1915, Berlin. Cinder since killed in battle near Ypres. Received this office torn to shreds, never delivered. Made out to a girl in Shreveport. Came back no such person here. Repeated attempts at tracing failed. Recoverable text as follows. Sleep has almost overcome me, and I can scarcely, there is no safe place here. Bodies that have lain out there, pressed raisins, cube sugar, nuts, safety razors, bullion cubes, insect powder, soggy excavations, Please to call them citizens, or my personal favorite, galloping freckles. Hard gray faces with deep lines running around their deep set eyes and hard pressed lips. Some lonesome, do so love. Please excuse this paper as the trenches are very muddy and my skin is parched with the fever that accompanies lack of sleep. Permit me to crave a small space in your everybody's corner for the following. Far from the star lights I'd love to be, lights of old London I'd rather see. Star lights, commonly known as varies, after Edward Very, the American naval officer who invented them, were a kind of greenish white flare sent up to illuminate no man's land. From time to time, starlights, starlight bombs gave off their steady brilliancy. They, from this distance, look like a trolley headlight coming toward you, but behind a slight hill. Their illuminating properties carry for miles, and the greenish-blue light seems so nonchalant in its passage to Earth. It gives one the feeling that it is bored by the ghastly business. The enemy's starlights are wonderful things. Their light is very white. Later, the moon came out very bright. The curious case of a soldier aged 31 years who has been in a state of lethargy 
for 27 months has been described to the surgical society. Patient was among the troops mobilized for the Marne. He disappeared, but was afterward found in Brittany. Since which, since which time he has been sleeping, eyelids closed, respiration regular, but pulse rapid. He is sensitive to excitement, stimulation provoking a weak defense, without, however, interrupting his sleep. It is possible to administer liquid food. The case is one of historical lethargy, and it is likely he will awaken time and resume his normal occupation. That was one, you know, I, I just, um, I spend a lot of time in the old newspaper databases, you know, doing historical research for um, a, lot, a lot of it for the nonprofit that Wiley mentioned in Wilmington. Um, and that can be a, a really fascinating and also kind of eerie um, place to spend time. And, I, and I, I started noticing that right, you know, during World War II, for the first time, there were all of these articles about the problem of insomnia. I mean, it had always been kind of a literary conceit, I guess, but it became this really serious um, military scientific problem. And so every sentence in that piece is, is taken directly out of a newspaper. Um, so I just jammed them all together and tried to make a little piece of music or whatever it is. Um, this one is called Moon. Lots of people I know in my life or know well enough to discuss things with tell me that they have a certain place or scenario that they visualize when lying in bed to help them fall asleep. I had a friend who would imagine lying in a hot bath in an igloo. My father used to picture himself in a middle bunk aboard a submarine, traveling under the North Pole beneath the ice pack in the dark. My own default scenario, sleeping on the moon, may in some respects be similar. It comes from reading crates of astronaut books when I was a kid. In particular, I would devour any book or magazine story that had to do with the Apollo flights, the lunar missions. For whatever reason, the part that seized my imagination was not the craft or the craters or anything like that, but sleep the problem of it. I would reread pages on how the astronauts slept on the moon. Partly it calmed me. If people could sleep up there on the lifeless moon where the most infinitesimal crack in your window would cause your head to explode, then I could sleep in a warm bed, even if it was uncomfortable or in an unhappy house. More than that though, it was sheer fascination. People had been on the moon and they had gone to sleep there. A condition that even on Earth, a person must feel relatively secure and relaxed to enter, these men had achieved on the moon, 240,000 miles from Earth. They were at that moment invisible specks in a lifeless void, yet they had closed their eyes. Before the first flight, NASA technicians had wondered how the astronauts would do it. One of the most seemingly provocative and least publicly discussed aspects of America's manned moon landing program, said one of my books, involved the questions, one, should the first American astronauts to land on the lunar surface spend almost as much time sleeping on the moon as they do in exploring it? Two, should the first astronauts that land on the lunar surface be permitted to sleep on the moon at all? Was sleep even possible there? Might they be too excited or afraid? Could they afford to waste all of that time, every minute of which cost millions of dollars? Should they take stimulants? These questions served as a rosary when I couldn't sleep until the habit itself became the thing. I remember reading that the astronauts on the first lunar mission, Apollo 11, had not slept well. There wasn't enough room. It was too noisy and bright. They were cramped and cold. They napped more than slept. 
They tossed and turned and worried about their equipment and experiments. With each mission, things improved a little. And by the time of Apollo 15, 16, and 17, in the early 70s, you can find reports of astronauts sleeping well in their hammocks. They had begun to notice that the lesser gravity on the moon, about one-sixth of what we experience on Earth, let their bodies rest lightly. Those hammocks felt like waterbeds, said Jim Irwin of Apollo 15, and we were light as a feather. Jack Schmidt of Apollo 17 remembered that there had been just enough pressure on your back in those hammocks to feel like you're on something, but not enough to ever get uncomfortable. Inside the lunar lander, it was pitch black after the shades had been drawn. A constant hum issued from the pumps and fans. On waking, the astronauts opened their eyes to the dark, then pulled up the blinds to reveal the blinding, nearly white surface of the moon. David Scott of Apollo 15 said that the astronauts on that mission, when they did sleep, felt like exotic birds in an elaborate cage. The best sleeper of them all was an astronaut named John Young, who flew on Apollo missions 10 and 16. The aviation historian Roland White described Young as seemingly entirely at home on another world. Young himself remembered that even though he had declined to take any of the sleeping pills that NASA gave to the astronauts, he slept like a brick. As for dreaming, there are no recorded lunar dreams. The United States Information Service proclaimed in 1969 that if indeed the astronauts have any dreams on the moon and are willing to reveal their contents, professional and amateur analysts may have work cut out for them for a long time to come. But no Apollo astronaut ever described a moon dream, not in print. Doubtless the men did dream. Maybe the dreams were horrific nightmares or too intimate to share. There are a few recorded space dreams experienced in Earth orbit. Studies have been done. Russian cosmonauts, at least in the early years, tended to have extremely terrestrial dreams. Landscapes, gardens, soil. One, Mikhail Kornienko, dreamed that he was on Earth and had missed his ride to space. The Americans' dreams were most often set in a weightless world. Their dream bodies floated. And if the dreamer were to float up to a rose, the rose, too, would be floating. An exception was Don Pettit, who lived in the International Space Station. He reported that although on Earth he had always dreamed of flying, in outer space he dreamed of walking. I guess it just shows, he said, that even in your dreams, there's a certain measure of discontent. Um, so I'll, I'll do one more. This is the last one, and then, then we can two questions if you have any. I hope you do. Or statements. You know, you can also just you can also just say something. Um, this one's called the barrel. It, um, it comes out of a, um, there's, a great, there's a great moment in, a, in the Shakespeare play, uh, Richard III, where um, um, the, 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 the king can't sleep, and he's, uh, he, he's, he gives this great speech about sleep, and he's kind of speaking directly to sleep, and he says, why, you know, I have this beautiful bed, I'm a king, I, I you know, I, I lay my head down on this soft pillow and, and I can't sleep, but, but you let the, uh, the cabin boy, the sea boy, up, up in the mast who falls asleep in the middle of a storm, you let him sleep, but you won't let me have it. It's this, and I always loved that image of the mast kind of moving in the storm and, the, and this little boy in the, in the crow's nest asleep. Um, this is called The Barrel. I am a captain, yes, but was once a ship's boy, not even as old as you. 
My father had been a sailor, an officer, and knew my mother for only a very short time before sailing off again. She was later forced to sue for his meager fortune. I was six when I met him. He had come back to London for only some days. My mother told him he could either marry her or take me to sea with him, and he chose me. It was a good choice. From what I saw of him during the next two years, he had not been made for marriage. He died at the hands of the Spaniards off the Azores when I was almost nine. He had sent me below decks right as the fighting started. I heard the cannons and then, faintly, the pistols, but that was all. They told me I might see him again in the next world. It was then I became a true wet sea boy and a skilled one. My father had held me back. I mean that he was protective. The others gave no thought to my safety and so treated me like a man, which is to say, like an animal, which I much preferred. I scrubbed and hauled rope or helped in the galley when asked. I did other jobs that are best unmentioned, vile work. We saw many strange sights. They run together now. One incident, though, I have never forgotten. We were sailing for the West Indies, a trade mission. It was peacetime and no one expected trouble. We were about a day's sailing east of the Bahamas when the wind blew strangely. Not gusts, more like sudden explosions. One of the old men who had been at sea the longest, since before my father's time, uttered the word the rest of us feared to speak. Huracano, that's how they used to say it. The native people of those islands would tell you it's one of their gods or a devil blowing terrible breath from the upper world. You can believe it. I never again knew fear like what moved through me when the billows started to rise and fall, looming up like a hillside until we were face to face with them, then dropping us into a canyon, taking my balls and stomach along. I was hurled like a puppet from one side of the ship to the other. Twice I heard a short scream, more like a moan in the second case, and whirled about to find that a man who had been standing behind me was gone. There was no saving anyone in that weather. At moments, the wind had a voice or voices like a choir of old women. More than once, I braced myself for the ship to be smashed into planks. The Marigold. She was built in the hull shipyards with wood from the royal forests, boards cut from the tallest, thickest trees marked with the king's broad arrow. My father had said she could take any wind, plunge into any trough in the sea, and rise up dripping, riding high. For two days and a half, we fought the devil's breath, and no man slept, nor any boy neither. Time bends when death is that close. Seconds were hours. Only late in the night on the third day did the storm start to weaken. It went on strong enough to have been a caution at any other time, but for us, by then, it was lake water. The captain warned us not to get comfortable. It could be a lull. Sometimes they would do that, briefly fade, then strengthen again. He stepped to the middle of the deck and called for a watchman. I felt the men's eyes turn to me. There was no arguing. I was the smallest and weakest. No other back could be spared. My arms and even my face were rigid with exhaustion and strain. Could I scale the rigging in the dark? I could have done it asleep, which is more or less what I did, climbing past the tattered, the t <clears throat> excuse me, climbing past the tattered sails. One had a burn hole blasted through the middle of it. Another hung in fragments from the bolt rope up like a monkey I went until I reached the crow's nest, although we didn't call it that then. It was just the barrel, and the sailor who kept watching it was the barrelman. It looked like a sort of deep wooden tub. I climbed in and took up my watch. 
I was up so high that the voices of the crew below barely carried. Their shouts came and went in little snatches, depending on the wind. They hollered up to me once or twice to know if I spied anything. The truth was I could hardly see. It was the kind of dark you could cut, and my eyes were weak with fatigue. I was far even from the feeble lanterns whose very flames made themselves small in fear. An hour went by, an hour and a half. I vaguely recall at one moment folding my arms on the edge of the barrel and resting the side of my face on them. I must have left it there a second too long. My body crumpled. I slid down into the tub and curdled up at the bottom. That's how small I was, how young. I fit perfectly. I have, of course, no memory of what happened next. I know it only because of what the men told me afterward. It seems that not long after I lost consciousness, the storm did what the captain had warned, re-strengthened and resurged. It was, they said, as if the tail had caught and lashed us. The sea grew wild like before, the wind boomed. We were blown helpless back and farther away from the island into open sea. The ship rocked even more violently, leaning at times almost sideways, such that the mast swung close to the waves as we flew. Picture the tub, and down in the tub a boy asleep in the cradle of the surge, warm enough with a patched up reefer jacket around him, his mouth hanging open, dreaming, because I did dream in the tub. In a funny way, it is my only memory of that second storm, pictures from another world. I dreamed of a king, an English king. I don't know which, maybe one of the Richards or Henrys. He had my father's face. He was in his bedchamber at night and wanted to sleep. A fire blazed. He had a soft bed with the softest blankets, but he had been up for days. It seemed to me that he had just fought in a battle he nodded his head and silently prayed, and wet snow plashed on his window. I remember no more, but I have never forgotten the poor king. He had come from somewhere, a story or poem I'd read in my hammock. I knew somehow that he would not live much longer. At dawn, I began to stir, aware of unexpected warmth, calm sea and winds. The ship bobbed and a fine kissing rain fell on my face. I climbed down the mast, and the men stood gazing at me with faces that seemed to tremble between surprise and fear. Some of them took me for an apparition. A couple did not stop believing it. Our Welsh cook, William, told me that. A man slender and small with a reed-like voice and a laugh so ready it sounded mad. He was the closest thing to a friend I had. Too much an uncle to be a friend, but loving to me. He confessed toward evening, as we knocked the ship back to together as best we could, keeping a list of, the I of items to buy on the island. He confessed that the men had rather quickly assumed I was lost and forgotten me. Surely I had been spilled out like a dumpling from a spoon on one of those wild swings when the barrel had all but skinned the foam. I was not lost, though, only sleeping. When we made anchor, the men, who if they did not fear me as a ghost, considered me bad luck at best, bribed the captain to leave me on the island. They sailed two hours before dawn. I was still asleep in a windowless room above a tavern. You have heard, no doubt, of the subsequent wreck of the Marigold. Betrayal was all that saved me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Anybody got any questions? How's it going? Great. How are you? Good. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, what's your research process? Um, clearly, a lot is done. Um, when you're writing, are you getting all of your research out there and so you feel like you're ready, or are you kind of writing, getting the idea out there and researching all the things? And does it differ for your fiction versus your essays? Um, try to think how it actually goes, you know, like there's that initial little, um, little spur of interest, you know, the, 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 the sand in the, in the oyster or the pea under the mattress or whatever the right metaphor is that, that gets you thinking about, about the thing. And, um, and then I dive into the into the research, and I'm collecting it as I go. And I've gotten I've gotten pretty um, um, disciplined over the years about keeping the research neat and accessible as I go, because you can you know you can sometimes do a lot of looking and scraping, and um, and it, it ends up just kind of a a chaos, and you almost have to do the whole process over again to figure out what you found. So I'm kind of putting things in a little sack as I go. And, and, um, and then there comes a point when you, you hit a wall and you have all of this stuff. And at that point, it, it becomes almost like a, um, like a sculptural process more, especially with these pieces that are so research heavy. I mean, some of them are, are there's almost no original prose. It's all just drawn from different sources. And, and um, then you really feel like you're kind of squeezing them into a certain shape. Some things are falling out. Other things are taking on importance. And, and, um, and, and, and from there, you know, the, from there you settle into a, a recognizable kind of writing where you're just, now you're focused on the story and making the material work for you. I think that's, I think that's the overall um, um, sequence, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm really into, I used to be very into and still love a writer named Paul Metcalf. And um, th those of you who are writing students or just, or just passionate readers, that's a name worth jotting down. He was a person who uh, spent a lot of time at Black Mountain, actually, in North Carolina, back when Charles Olson was there and, and the, these very serious people, you know. Um, Paul Metcalf was really interesting. He was Melville's great grandson, and um, his 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 life psychologically, as as a writer, as a young writer, was very it was very interesting what happened to him because when he was very young, Melville was still kind of thought of as um, as uh, uh, kind of a failed writer who wrote a weird book about whales and then worked at the customs office the rest of his life, you know. His, his, um, Melville's reputation was rehabilitated when Paul Metcalf was, you know, like a boy, like 12 or 13. So all of a sudden his great grandfather becomes, you know, one of the greatest American writers and he had to kind of deal with that. And the way he did it, it seems, and this is by his own telling, was to not work with any of his own prose he didn't he, he he only it was all pastiche you know he he would and he would dig very deep and and and, and f very far flung sources to find these amazing sentences that he then brought back and put together and his work is not like anyone else's work and some of it is really beautiful some of it's kind of unreadable you know and his uh, um, coffee house press did a collected paul metcalf that's like three volumes and each one is, you know, 800 pages. Um, but I, I, I definitely had him in my head when I was doing some of these pieces and, and took it as a kind of permission to um, just to, to work almost in a sort of collage form, scraps, you know, that are then that made into something different, something new. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, is there a subject that you find most rewarding to work in, whether it be like history or personal experience or science or anything like that? Is there one that you find you're able to do more with? I think I'm always looking for things I haven't 
I haven't messed with before, you know, to, to keep myself guessing, sort of, to keep, you know, just keep from getting, um, I don't know, there, there, there's a great um, line that um, Tom Waits, the musician and songwriter, was interviewed one time about his songwriting and he talked about how when you're a musician, your hands are kind of like dogs and they, they get um, uh, habituated to going to the water bowl and then going to the bed and then going outside to go to the bathroom and, and they start to just do that when you pick up the instrument. And he said he was always changing instruments to kind of confuse his hands and his fingers to make them go places that were surprising even to him, you know. And I think I do something, I think I'm always looking to make that happen. At the same time, that answer is a little bit full of crap maybe because definitely you could look at the stuff I've written and see that there are these um, obsessive themes, you know. Um, I almost would be the last person to ask about what they are. I, I, I try to stay unaware <laughs> in, some, in some sense, you know. Um, but childhood is a, is, a, is a big thing, music. Um, um, southern history, 18th century history, there are certain things that I, that I go back to over and over. Well, a thing I loved about working for magazines, which I don't do as much anymore, but I used to be a, you know, a really hardcore magazine writer traveling all the time. You were just constantly having these new subjects thrown at you. And you would have to kind of stop and for six months of your life just do obsessive research on whatever the thing was, you know. And I, 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 loved, I loved that when I was doing it. It, kind of, it, it sort of um, ground me out after a while. Um, but it was, it was fun while it lasted for sure and, and probably kind of healthy for me as a writer, you know, just to be forced out, even if it's just out of the house, you know, to, to do some reporting. Hey there. Um, you know, it's a lot like what I was saying earlier about, about the, 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 the research, about the gathering, and then the, and then the shaping, and the, um, um, a, a different way maybe to answer it that, that would maybe be useful to some of you who are studying writing is just, that, is just to say that um, it's possible these days to do a kind, of, a kind of research digitally that has never been possible for any generation of writers. Um, and that, that, that's the kind of thing, you know, it, it, it's easy to get all excited about technology and say, oh, it's making new things possible. But in this case, it really is almost a, it, it's so different than it used to be that it's, it, it's, it has almost made possible a different kind of cognition, you know. Um, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you do any kind of academic research, for instance, if you're a, um, you know, if you're a scholar in the humanities, you can do things in hours that, that professors, writers, literally used to spend years trying to do, you know. The difference is, is so, so vast that it's almost kind of a different reality. And um, familiarizing yourself with that digital world, that landscape, where the sources are, where the archives and databases are, um, how to get into them, how to navigate once you get there, how to use search terms and, um, you know, you, because you almost have to play those databases like an instrument, you know, they're not, they're not, um, the, 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 the robots that have been invented to read all of that text can't, they can't read all of it and they don't read it precisely, but they can see 60, 70% of it. So you're always trying to trick it into showing you what you want to know. Um, and, 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 and the other side of that coin is that it has created new problems for a writer because you can just, it, it's just possible to know way too much and you're constantly getting sandbagged and overwhelmed, you know. 
this is this is something that happens to me on like a weekly basis. I'll get very interested in a certain thing, like oh, there was this murder in uh, in uh, Asheville or whatever it is, you know, back in the 1830s, and this really weird thing happened. Wow, I'd love to know about that and read a little bit about it. Well, within a couple of hours, you realize that there's like a a year of reading to be done on that one little thing, and you have to make some some fairly stark choices about you know how much time you're going to give to it and and it's just very easy to get um but to have the the sand kind of fall you know come down on top of you in fact that's kind of where i i, I feel like i i spend a lot of time in that state just feeling like God, what am i going to do here you know i have to find a way out of this subject but you want you know but it's very hard to write about a thing when you know there's more to be known about it, it puts you in this weird um, um, kind of uh, uncertain state, you know, place. Um, because as a writer, you just want to know everything there is to know. Well, that used to mean reading like four books and a couple of essays and then maybe finding an old newspaper article. Now it means tens of thousands of words that are instantly accessible to you. And um, I just, I, I feel like this new generation, like you all, really are going to have to figure out kind of how to operate in that new that new situation as as writers you know hi hi so just to go off what they said so do you prefer to work on deadlines then self-imposed deadlines versus somebody telling you you got a deadline so that you can help with that or one could you just cut bait at some point so you have to cut it off um, I'm, I'm, I'm just the worst person on earth to ask about that. I'm a, I'm a nightmare about deadlines and, and, um, I have a bad reputation among editors for that sort of thing. I mean, I, I like to think that I make up for it in the end by handing over something that's really comprehensive and, but of course I would tell myself that just to, to sleep at night, you know, um, I, I, I it, you're, it's, you're asking about a very real problem that I have not solved. Um, and as a result, I, there, there are things that, pieces of writing I'm really passionate about that were due like 10 years ago that I'm still messing with, you know? And then I'll do other shorter things in the meantime just to keep functioning as a writer, but um, it's, uh, it's hard. I mean, I mean, these are problems that I guess were all that, that that have always faced writers, but now they're on steroids. You know, just because of the, the the amount of research that a person can can do from from a a, a seated position. You know. Um, but 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 I think for 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 a a, a, a more for, 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 a, for a writer who's more well-adjusted than I am, the, the, the deadlines are maybe very helpful that way because you do, you know, it's like I, I could keep doing, I, I could keep doing research, but the thing is due on Friday, so this is the end. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I've just become used to just kind of watching the deadline go by, you know. I write really good apology emails, you know, like that, that, that is a form unto itself, you know. Sorry, that's not a very good answer, but it's but it's it's honest. Hi. Um, when you do find yourself finished with what you've done, what makes you realize that? Like oh. when you know that you're done in comparison to when you feel like you can work on something. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, because that does happen. You you the thing you're writing, the form of the thing, does take over at a certain point, and it, and and it and it takes on a little more um, authority than the than the all of that research you can hear humming out there that you haven't done. It's like the thing itself, the story you're trying to tell, like the like those pieces that I read were that way. I mean, it's I could have kept going on all of them, but at a certain point the the story itself had kind of said, yeah, I don't, I know you could keep going, but you need to make me, you know, like, I, and, and now you're starting to see me and what I look like and where I'm going. And, 
and, and, and then it becomes possible to maybe relax a little bit and think, okay, I have enough, you know. So that, that, that can be kind of a saving, um, a saving grace, you know. It's like a, it's like a, um, a flip of some kind that happens, you know, it's, it's, it's you, it's your mind, it's all of the research and you're projecting that onto this canvas and then at a certain point everything kind of turns around and the canvas starts to dictate, I want this, I need this, I, and, and that's a good feeling and that happens for sure. Well, thank you very much. It was really, oh, one more, sorry, hey. Uh, I was on your struggle with sleep. Do you find like that you are creative and you do more rewriting when you're unable to sleep? Or is that kind of like a detriment to your writing? I think, I think it's both. I think it, ch it changes at a certain point. It can be. It can be good when, it, when, it, when, when a bout of insomnia first hits me, a lot of times I'll get out of bed and, and work in order to, partly in order to put myself back to sleep. Um, and, but, but, but when it really becomes chronic, then I feel like it, it kind of weakens, your, you know, your mind gets soft just from the, from the lack of sleep and you, and you you're kind of, you get into a, a, a thing where you, you feel like you're never fully awake. And I don't, and that is not productive for me, you know. I've started taking this pill, I'll just tell you, <laughs> called um, clonidine. I've been on it for um, maybe a year and a half now. And it's, it's one of the, you know how some of these pills have, they end up being useful for a totally different thing. Like, it was for blood pressure, it didn't work for that, but it turns out it's a good antidepressant or whatever. This is one that I think was originally for, um, like, something to do with blood, maybe, but it turns out that it works as a sleeping pill for people who, who don't otherwise have luck with the usual Ambien family of drugs, you know. It's, um, and, it, and, it, and it kind of um, suppresses your dreams. That's one interesting thing about it. You dream, but you dream in a different way. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I've been sleeping fairly well with that recently, or at least sleeping. I still wake up at 2.33 every night, and I'm up until maybe 6, and then I get a couple more hours. There's this theory that you may have read about. It's not a theory. It's kind of a discovery, I guess, that um, this is how we used to sleep, that there used to be two sleeps. Have you read about that, the, the first one? The back, this is back in the Middle Ages, I guess, when there was no electricity and people, their rhythms were more in sync with um, the sun and agricultural activity or whatever. And uh, people would, would go to sleep shortly after dark, I guess, and um, sleep for a period of hours. And then they would wake up. And there was this time in the, that existed in the in the wheel of people's days and lives that we don't really have anymore when everybody was up. Um, and they would uh, have a meal and pray and have sex and do whatever people were doing and then go back to sleep afterward. And, and, and they would actually refer to it as uh, the second sleep, that second little. And you can read in old letters from the from the Middle Ages, you know, people saying, and I, and, and I was midway through my second sleep when I, when such and such happened, and you know, um, as I almost feel like maybe I've kind of fallen into that, um, but but with pharmaceuticals, not with natural <laughs> processes, you know. <laughs> you of course, yeah, whatever you, whatever you want. Thank you very much. That was really a pleasure.